Hello and welcome to another edition of 10 for 10, 10 minutes for 10 days in the book of Philippians. Yesterday we looked at Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 and we discovered three requirements for living a life worthy of the gospel. We actually only discovered the first two. We'll be looking at the third requirement today. But yesterday we saw the first requirement was that we needed to get pumped up and the second requirement was to have gospel-centered unity. This unity is only possible when we demonstrate humility, as Paul talked about in verses 3 and 4. So today we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, and discover that final requirement to living a life worthy of the gospel. Let's go ahead and read those verses together. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The third requirement for living a life worthy of the gospel is this. We need to follow the ultimate example. And who is that example? Well, it's a no-brainer. It's Jesus Christ himself. Paul starts out by saying that in our relationships with one another, we need to have the exact same mindset, the exact same attitude as that of Christ. What was that mindset? Well, it was humility, as Paul's already talked about in verses 3 and 4. But what did that look like for Jesus, and what should that look like for us as his followers? I'm glad you asked. That's what we're going to be talking about as we look at this final requirement. First of all, we see that Jesus never demanded his rights. In verse 6, we see that Jesus is in his very nature God. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by the power of his word. See, Jesus wasn't partially God. He was fully God, the exact radiance of his glory. And so Jesus could have demanded his own way. He could have demanded his rights. He could have taken full advantage of his deity in heaven. He could have clung to his rights and refused to give them up. But Jesus isn't about that. Jesus was never about self-promotion. He's always about bringing honor and glory to the Father. He is the ultimate example. Well, secondly, we see that Jesus emptied himself. In verse 7, it says that he literally made himself nothing. Now, some people have interpreted that to mean that Jesus Christ ceased to be fully God at that moment or that he somehow stripped himself of his attributes. But that is not what this passage is saying at all, that Jesus didn't cease being God for one second. You remember John chapter 2, at the end of John chapter 2, Jesus, we learn, says that he knew what was in the hearts of people, that Jesus still maintained his omniscience his ability to know all things. In John chapter 9, he heals a blind man. In John chapter 11, he raises Jesus from the dead. He's demonstrating his power. He's demonstrating the fact that he is om omnipotent, that he is all-powerful. And so Jesus was fully God in those moments. He didn't simply pick up his deity one moment and then set it aside in the next, that he always is and always will be fully God. That's who he is, and he cannot deny himself. So how did Jesus empty himself then? What does this phrase mean? Well, we see that Jesus emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant. Paul had just used that word nature up in verse 6. That Jesus in his very nature was God, but he chose to take the very nature of a servant. He adopted both the appearance and being of a servant. Pastor Ken Hughes said it this way, that Jesus did not exchange the form of God for the form of a slave. Rather, he manifested the form of God in the form of a slave. In other words, Jesus never ceased to be God. Rather, he chose to manifest himself to show his deity by taking the form of a servant. Nowhere do we see this more clearly than in John chapter 13. If you remember John chapter 13, Jesus is in the upper room. They're getting ready for the meal, and no one has yet washed their feet. And so Jesus strips off his outer garment and begins to wash the disciples' feet that he set aside his rights, he emptied himself, and he took the form of a servant. He washed their feet. And then he instructed them to go 
and do likewise. In other words, a true follower of Christ expresses his or her new identity in Christ by taking the nature of a servant. But more than that, Paul adds that Jesus emptied himself by being born. Think about that. The eternal Son of God was born. And more surprising yet, he was born in the likeness of men. That phrase is referring to his identification with the human race, that Jesus fully participated in the human experience. He was 100% God, and he was 100% human. He emptied himself. But the text goes even further. In verse 8, it says that Jesus humbled himself. To quote Pastor Kent Hughes again, he said, Christ never became humble because he was humble. See, this is who Jesus is. Jesus Christ, God himself, is the epitome of what it means to be humble. Listen, no one humbled him. No one can humble the Almighty God. Jesus had to humble himself. Think about that in relationship to the crucifixion, right? Herod didn't humble Jesus. Pilate didn't humble Jesus. The high priest Caiaphas didn't humble Jesus. The Romans didn't even humble Jesus. Jesus would say in John 10, 17, and 18, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. The writer of Hebrews said this in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God? Jesus humbled himself. And this act of self-humiliation led to his obedience. He submitted himself to the Father's will. As Jesus prayed in the, garden, in the garden, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. He humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. See, crucifixion was designed to be a very humiliating act. The Romans had perfected it where they could keep someone hanging on the cross alive for days. They would parade those who were being executed naked through the streets making them carry their own crossbeam. They would hang there as an object of ridicule for all to see. It was a humiliating experience through and through. And yet this is what Jesus chose to go through for you and for me. He humbled himself. But I want you to notice something else in this passage. I want you to see the blessings of living a life worthy of the gospel in verses 9 through 11. See, what happened when Jesus humbled himself? What happened when he lived out Philippians 2, 1 through 8? The text tells us that God exalted him. This is exactly what Jesus said would happen in Matthew chapter 23, verses 11 and 12. Jesus said, The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. How did God exalt Jesus? Well, first of all, he exalted him to the highest place. What is that highest place? Well, it's being seated at the right hand of God. The psalmist uh, prophesied this would happen in Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And friends, that's where Jesus is sitting right now. We'll talk more about that on Sunday when we look at Jesus' ascension. But Jesus is there right now as part of his exaltation. Secondly, God exalted him by giving him the name that is above every name. And so again, we need to ask, what is that name? Well, if we skip ahead to verse 11, we learn what it is, that Jesus Christ is Lord. The name Lord there is the Greek word Kyrios. It's the name used in the Greek Old Testament to represent Yahweh, the personal name of God himself. And so the name that is above every name is God's name. It's the very name of God. God said this through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8. said, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another. And yet it's here in Philippians chapter 2 that God gives this name to Jesus, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus humbled himself and God exalted him. And one day every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, real quickly, if this is the example that we need to follow, then what does this, does this look like for us? How should we live in light of this example? It simply means this, that in everything we do, we need to take the form of a servant, that we need to humble ourselves, that we need to stop trying to promote ourselves, we need to stop trying to be the greatest at everything, 
We need to stop lusting after power and fame. We need to stop making everything about us. We simply need to humble ourselves, and in due time, he will lift us up. And so I want to leave you with this question today. What can you do to take the form of a servant? What's one thing that you can do right now in this moment? What's one thing you can do later today to take the very form of a servant? Well, thanks again for joining us for this episode of 10 for 10. We're halfway through and we got lots of great things to talk about in the days ahead. I hope you'll continue to join us as we learn how to live a joy-filled life in the midst of our present circumstances.